This is a CanMed 2017 uh, re-recording of a presentation, uh, re-recording to include a few um, details in regards to questions that were asked, but the, um, the theme of this dis discussion is how to decentralize cannabis genetics. How do we get sequencers and the genomics point of grow so that the, <clears throat> the largest number of people can actually be contributing to, um, to genomic sciences in the cannabis field? Well, to do that, we're, we're going to need some, some nomenclature, and we're going to discuss how to, how to build that nomenclature and how to build the tools that will ultimately drive uh, point of grow genomics in, in, um, in the cannabis field. So why do we want to do this? We want to do this because in general, when you look at marketplaces, those that decentralize go through extraordinary growth. Um, decentralization actually brings more innovators into the marketplace. Uh, it is, uh, creates a permissionless innovation environment where those, everyone in the network and it has, has sees a bit more of a level playing field. And this is in, in direct contrast to what you might see from a top-down federal approach to manage this, where, where we're attempting to see studies for PTSD um, be performed and uh, with all the, uh, the work in the world, we still can't seem to get um, a, PTSD, a PTSD study done with uh, veterans that are committing you know, suicide, 22 people a day. It it's, uh, seems like the urgency is there, but uh, it's impossible to, to navigate such an infrastructure. So um, the partial decentralized network that we're seeing today with states' rights is actually quite a laboratory of democracy, and we are seeing all types of innovation come from that marketplace. So anything that can help catalyze more decentralization uh, is a good thing. And let's just take a look at a few historical examples to drive the point home. If you look at Gutenberg's printing press, it really wasn't about the first book that was printed. It was the fact that anyone could print one that really created a renaissance. And the same is true for the internet. Uh, having the narrative no longer centrally controlled has now brought us to a very vibrant debate about what's fake news and real news. Uh, and I argue this is actually a very good thing. People are now looking for references and being more self-reliant about the scientific content of what's presented to them, uh, a step forward for humanity indeed. And then with Bitcoin, we're seeing a a market demand for non-centralized bank currency, currency that is governed by cryptography and mathematics uh, and is ironclad. And this $30 billion market seems to be on a tear that won't stop. And then we have the capacity to read the code of life is now fits now something that fits in your back pocket. We have USB-based DNA sequencers that are emerging, and while they may be error-prone today, uh, the trajectory of improvements for these platforms are quite remarkable, such that it is inevitably going to decentralize sequencing, which is a good thing. Today, to get in the sequencing game, you need millions of dollars of overhead just to even purchase one of these sequencers, let alone run it, uh, and these can cost anywhere between $100,000 to a $1 million, and now we're seeing mobile phone-based DNA sequencers that cost $1,000 emerge. Likewise with PCR, we are seeing a transition from older equipment that is in the $15,000 to $20,000 range into portable equipment that you can put on the space station, USB-driven PCR devices. And our goal at MGC is to drive applications that fit on these decentralized platforms. And when we say applications, we mean primers and reagents and intellectual property regarding what targets uh, to amplify that are predictive for better agricultural genomics uh, and better performance with cannabis grows in general. So to do this, you usually need some standard set. If you look at the internet, it needed TCP IP for it to really take off. If you look at Bitcoin, it really needs everyone running the same code and agreeing on the same SHA-256 algorithms and these, the elliptic curve cryptography that goes on. All of these are agreed upon on everyone who runs the network of Bitcoin, and Gutenberg probably had a, a demanded font size. So sometimes these markets, in order for them to decentralize, uh, they need to lay down some rails, if you will. So we're laying down those rails. Uh, we have been doing a tremendous amount of sequencing in the cannabis, in cannabis genomes. We have done several whole genome shotguns that we've put public, several other strain seq version ones, which are three megabases of sequencing across all the plants. Um, probably we've probably done over a thousand plants that way. Um, we have put several of these things public, but each of these different tiers of strain seq sequencing that we perform is really looking at a different number of single nucleotide polymorphisms. It's kind of a different magnification, if you will, like in a in the lens of, of optics or a magnet or a magnifying glass. We've got <clears throat> panels that, that sequence 100,000 SNPs, 10,000 SNPs, 1,000 SNPs, and we're going to touch on a platform that just genotypes about 50 of them, and they can do it in the field. So in laying these um, rails, we 
want to build a nomenclature system, which means we want to sequence enough of the plants out there so we understand the genetic diversity that can exist with inside the cannabis pool. And we're collecting all of this at a place called Canopedia.net. All of this is Bitcoin blockchain linked. Okay, all of these strains we have etched the genetics into the blockchain, so there's irreversible timestamps floating around for when these strains existed, and this can be a very helpful defensive intellectual property tool. Now, this new Canopedia depiction gives a sense of a genetic distance of all the strains that are in there. So anything that's in red, as you highlight and hover over this um, this uh, cladogram, you will get a color coding in terms of its genetic distance. The red ones are clones, and the siblings are in orange, and it goes in Roy G. Biv um, order here. So things that are blue are really distant from your strain, and those might be interesting things to breed with. Um, so this can give you guidance on, on proximity genetically to other strains and also distance to other strains if you're looking for interesting crosses and vigor. Now, one thing that's also loaded into this database is several hundred samples which have been chemotyped. And so you can quickly select on regions that look like they're a clone distance apart and ask, hey, what type of terpene profiles do I have? And in this case, you see very consistent ratios of myrcene, pinene, and bisabolo amongst four different um, uh, CBD lines that um, are all named differently but apparently have um, almost a genetic distance that would imply they're probably clones uh, and yet we see remarkable consistency with the terpene um, profile for each of those. You can select in other regions as well and see that the same thing's happening with terpenaline uh, and beta carophylline and other strains and so the, the genetics here can predict the terpene class and I think that's an important point. We can't predict the quantity it's going to express, that's in the hands of the grower, but we can certainly tell you whether it's going to be a beta carophylline dominant strain or a uh, or a terpene or a terpenaline dominant strain based on the genetics that are um, you know, where it falls on this map effectively. You can also go in split controversies. All right, if uh, there's controversy over nomenclature, well, Blue Dream we decided to look into and sequence a couple dozen of these with some help from a lot of collaborators around the country. And uh, when you look at this DNA, certainly a lot of the Blue Dreams do cluster up in one side of the graph, driving at this distributed consensus of, of cannabis genetics. We can utilize the, the uh, consensus that gets built by sequencing you know, a couple dozen of the strain names to sort out what is in fact the real Blue Dream here. And everything you can see highlighted in yellow floating around the radius of this map are in fact, we believe, not Blue Dream, something that has been mislabeled or um, counterfeited in some way. Um, you can zoom in on this and see the, uh, the genetic distance is there and obviously there's a snoop stream in there that is looks no different than Blue Dream and is being um, you know probably called snoop stream to capture some more cash um, due to the <clears throat> due to the name. So this can be handy to have these as uh, as charts to understand the genetics that you're working with but layered into this database we have about 10 percent of the samples that have been terpene profiled we have also performed microbiome sequencing on and we're doing this because the microbiomes are very important in cannabis one the only pate pill that have ever died from cannabis are people who have gotten microbes into their lungs for immunocompromised patients getting aspergillus in their lungs can be a 50 percent fatality rate and we had two patients like this allegedly die in California in 2017. They were cancer patients and it's believed that the microbes from cannabis got to their lungs and they succumbed to those infections. So we need to understand the microbiomes of cannabis for safety. Uh, we've published two papers on this. We encourage people to look at those. They're in F1000. But the other thing that's interesting about terpenes is they seem to be playing a role in the communication with, um, I'm sorry, the microbes seem to be playing a role with the communication in the plant with terpenes. Here's a paper where they did antibiotic fum fumigation of some plants and watched the terpene expression change as a result of it. Um, and these are terpenes that are uh, we are quite familiar with in the cannabis field. They linalool and, and pinene. These are things that are frequently found in cannabis. So we suspect the same thing will happen uh, in cannabis. Now. With all the sequence information that's in Canopedia, there's enough data density uh, to actually do genome-wide association studies. So something that's unique about the strain seed pipeline compared to other folks in the field performing sequencing is we're usually sequencing seven times the amount of territory of any other test on the marketplace. Um, this is overkill to give somebody a fingerprint to tell them what kind of strain it is. And we're going to show you what how much overkill it really is in a few slides. But uh, it is very helpful if you want to do genome-wide association studies. What you need there is a SNP every gene so that you can correlate particular expression patterns you see, phenotypes, with particular SNPs. And when you can do that, you can use that SNP as a marker to predict that phenotype is eventually going to be expressed. And we can see that here with a 
uh, with some markers uh, <clears throat> that may predict terpenaline expression. We did a genome-wide association study and asked, show us all the markers that are correlated with, terpen with terpenaline expression, and out comes this particular GG SNP that's in all of the samples that have high terpenaline expression. So we need to flesh this out with more um, with more data, more samples, and see if this repeats itself in a larger cohort. And uh, those that work is ongoing, but assuming it does, this is something we want to keep on our eye as we think about point of growth genomics. What if you could get the terpene information from a from a leaf punch, uh, and it would predict what type of terpene clash your plant's going to be, and everything else about it. That those days are coming. All right, so a third thing that we did to service the field and drive toward this nomenclature system is we built a Rosetta Stone panel. That is a panel that sequences regions in all of the strains that are out there. So to back up a little bit, many people have now been contributing to cannabis genomics. We have the Kane Lab have just published a beautiful paper on over 300 samples. Uh, we've seen the Soiler Lab published on the close to 85 or 90 samples um, out of Canada. We've seen Phylos put 845 samples public. Um, and all of these are using different methods and sequencing different amount of density. Um, the Canopedia sample submissions are sequencing the most number of bases per sample, but there's not as many samples as the, the sample numbers seen in, in the Phylos data set. So they're, they're complementary data sets, and people want to use these data sets together. But the problem is that each group is sequencing a different region of the cannabis genome, and so you can't re readily cross-compare the data. Until now, uh, this Rosetta Stone panel sequences enough SNPs in each one of those data sets such that we can triangulate any sample into all of them, and this makes for a great nomenclature tool, and it makes for a great intellectual property tool. If you are looking for, your, if your strain is unique for intellectual property reasons, um, you need to really look at all of the um, data that's out there, and it's difficult to do that right now until unless you use this panel. Um, now, the other thing that the panel did in the design is we targeted this this little exome, micro exome uh, region, if you will, in the Van Bakel uh, paper. These are all the genes involved in cannabinoid and terpene synthase um, or synthesis. Uh, or most of them, I shouldn't say all of them. John Page is discovering more every day, but this is a, a good place to start. So in sequencing all of these SNPs that helps Rosetta Stone um, all of the data together, we are also sequencing the genes most related to making cannabinoids and terpenes. And by doing that, we're going to have markers um, that are going to be more meaningful to chemotypes. And why do we want these markers? Well, if you could imagine um, every plant just being a list of SNPs, uh, like these are the genetics, the genetics behind each one of these. It'd be one list of maybe 1,100 SNPs as you saw before, but that's a lot of information to put on a product barcode, and we can condense that greatly by just running um, some analysis in the data set and saying sort all of the SNPs based on those that have the highest discriminatory power in the data set. What are the most unique SNPs? And when you do this, you can distill it down to under 30 SNPs that code for anything in Canopedia. Uh, and if that's the case, we can readily convert those 30 SNPs into maybe 15 letters or maybe maybe even less than that if you use a really dense code, um, such that you could have a barcode that would pinpoint your plant uh, from a genomic standpoint right into Canopedia. So how does this look when we do this in the Blue Dream cluster that was full of clones? Well, here's the Blue Dream cluster as it looks from a sequencing standpoint. We have every Blue Dream sample sitting there vertically, and in the green boxes uh, are the homozygous variants at those locations, and the heterozygous ones are in yellow, and pink ones are homozygous for the other allele. Uh, and you can readily look at all the different loci in here, these 20, I think there's actually 27 here in this, this, this chart, uh, of the different SNP patterns that you see for each of those scaffold locations. All right, so this allows, you can see, this allows us to readily discern clones that you see in the center area right here from actual the sibling differences. And you'll see written down here, these are the actual positions on the Canopedia tree. There seems to be a unique sibling over here that looks like it has that variant. There's um, a bunch of clusters in this 3A, this 3 a.m. region, and then there's another some neighbors sitting out out here that are a little bit more distant that have these variants, and then you get into 2:45, which is which is up here, and then 10:30, 4 a.m. and 8 a.m. Those are the ones that sat out all around the periphery. Um, so we can readily discriminate with 29 steps between clones and siblings and pinpoint anything on the tree. And if you can do that, it stops. You stop and ask, well, we 
This isn't a lot of snips. We could probably do this point of grow. We may not need to put a sequencer on our back, or we can use one of these new USB sequencers, or possibly even something simpler than sequencing and even cheaper than those USB sequencers. We could think about doing color metric portable Q, uh, QPCR. So this is something that um, was in, you, we really could not have a not invented here syndrome in making this work. It was a fairly complicated project. Uh, it had the help of New England Biolabs, of Eichen Chemical, of Amplius and Mini PCR, and a little bit of Oxford Nanopore mixed in. But what we're going to show you are these portable PCR devices that are coupled with a color metric readout so that you don't need to carry a detector head with you on your PCR device. You can just use your eyeball or your um, <clears throat> or your smartphone to record positive PCR events. So this is a $650 USB driven mini PCR device, extraordinarily lightweight, went up on the space station as a result of its weight. Uh, it is an eight well PCR device. We have assays that are 750 per test. This is cheaper than anything uh, that you can do putting it in the mail. Um, and these costs are very sensitive to volume. If you have a lot more samples, uh, these volume t costs are going to go down, and we're going to touch on that as to why. And also, um, we spent a lot of effort in developing an InstaPrep. That is, take a whole punch, put it in a magic solution, boil it for 95 degrees. When it's done with that boil, that material goes straight into a color metric reaction. No DNA purification. Just to straighten... Um, slick boil into a, into, a, into a reaction and in 90 minutes later you'll have an answer of something turning yellow if, it's, if the target's there or remaining pink if it's not. Now, the reason this is helpful is because we had several attorneys consult us regarding whether we could put Kaledons on paper and put them in the mail like many other vendors. Uh, and despite um, getting rejected by many lawyers on this, we would go to a second lawyer and then a third layer. And finally, we got tired of going to uh, to lawyers over this and decided instead of trying to get the, the <clears throat> plant material to us, let's bring the PCR device to the plant. Uh, and that's kind of the, the, the impetus here. So, uh, and, and the reason is, is we really are not interested in becoming a, a honeypot database of people who have violated the CSA. Uh, these attorneys believe you can put DNA in the mail and stock in the mail, but you cannot put photosynthetic material stamped onto paper in the mail. Um, consult your own attorneys on this, but uh, we figured we'd just uh, honor the CSA and divide, design tools that are congruent with the call memo and move on. Um, and there's a DNA privacy issue at hand here. When you send your DNA in for testing in a, a, at any other lab, check the T's and C's. They can sequence the whole genome from that, and many of the current plant patents are speaking about genetics. Um, so buyer beware. Um, this is a, a $650 device, uh, and uh, it is very, very lightweight, as mentioned before, but the assays we've built for it are quite intriguing. We've, we have spent, spent a lot of time doing single molecule sequencing on the BD allele, and now have distilled a multiplex assay that targets that gene uh, for functionality. And uh, in doing so, if there is a CBD allele present, we will turn the sample will turn yellow. If it's THC positive, it will remain pink. Uh, this will not discern between one or two copies of, of a CBD allele. So heterozygous BD alleles will still come through. What does that mean? That means type 1 plants are pink, type 2 and type 3 are yellow in this case. Uh, we've also extended this to male-female. So in the event you have a male, uh, you may want to throw it out, but if it has a CBD allele, maybe you should keep it and continue to breed for more CBD genetics. And then we've expanded this onto 96 wool plates and into these really slick, cheap hot plates that are under 800 bucks. So you can get in on this at the 96 well level for extraordinarily cheap instrument costs, cheaper than any other QPCR instrument out there. Um, okay, so we took this on a, on a beta trial. Uh, off to several different places, CT Pharma, the Slata Center, and Colorado Seeds, and started poking things, uh, poking hole punches into plants and putting them into 96 well plates so that we could run studies like this. And uh, we sampled a bunch of visually confirmed males and females, uh, so what we call knowns, and 47 out of 47 of those were correct at, at Colorado Seeds. This is a little bit better than usual. We tend to see about 96%, um, 95, 96% is the rate we tend to see on large data sets. So there is a subset of genetics um, that don't comply with our primer, our primer sets, and we're still working on that. If you have a pair of them, if you have, if you have plants like that, get them to us. We will extend the, um, the primers to fit other plants as necessary. Um, but this was baked off against a visual method where people take an image of the actual seed shape and can infer the, um, the gender from, 
from there. Uh, that doesn't seem to have a very high concordance with the genetics, and so I think the data right now is leaning in favor of Y chromosomes over seed shapes. Of course, we also expanded this test to include the CBD allele, looked at uh, many of the stuff, uh, the samples purified by Sonoma Labs out of the Emerald Cup from 2015. These are all HPLC confirmed for CBD, and you can see we have very consistent and robust results uh, from the Emerald Triangle area. We also uh, hit a Colorado hemp farm with this and have very consistent results with uh, within the hemp farm. And we also did um, leaf punches in Massachusetts, and we can discern CBD from typical THC-positive type 1 plants like Blue Dream and AK-47. Uh, here's a list of every CBD plant we've tried to date that it's worked on. So we're, building the, we're expanding this list every day just so we have a database of what, we know, what the assay works on and what it doesn't. Um, and uh, there's obvious extensions from this. If you can do plus minus tests on cannabis genetics, well, why aren't we looking for the things that might kill people? Let's look at aspergillus. Let's look at E. coli, stack, and salmonella. These, these are um, all addressable with this platform. We are in the process of validating all of them down to five genomic copies per test. Um, and uh, it seems to have that sensitivity so far with aspergillus and, and E. coli and stack. Uh, we do have a NIDA grant to actually expand this to mycotoxins. Um, initially, it's probably going to be quantitative PCR uh, with an immuno-PCR approach, but it may actually also be amenable to UPCR. Um, now, if we can do genotyping this simply with iPhones, taking pictures of things, and there's only 29 uh, discriminatory SNPs that are required to differentiate all the strains in Canopedia, um, we would think about scale. Genomic scales very effectively. Uh, this is Moore's Law, and you can see genomics is having a very large departure in terms of the cost per base uh, going down much more rapidly than Moore's Law. What that means is for this test, we can steal a chapter out of history and just repeat it. Uh, we don't have to be doing these in single tubes. We can go into 96-well format. We can go into 3D4-well format. We can go to many other liquid formats to actually drive the scalability of this. So the price elasticity in this is quite attractive because you can scale this down uh, and that makes for some interesting things to consider. Uh, you go to 96 well plates, you get to 20 microliters. We've done this in 3D4 well plates at 10 microliter reactions and we're playing around with 1536 um, assay formats to get it down to two and a half microliters. This tenfold drop in uh, reagent costs means that we can think about doing 10 times the number of targets uh, for the same price. So 30 SNPs would just be three tests. So we could probably get the full genotype of a plant done, point of grow, with an iPhone readout that lands you on Canopedia uh, for uh, less than the cost of getting your THC measured at a, at a laboratory. And while you're at it, this since this scales so nicely, you might as well throw in a handful of other contaminants and concerns like aspergillus, whether it's male, female, if it's CBD, maybe some of your preferred uh, terpene markers as they evolve, or maybe you should even screen for the, the nastiest pest on cannabis that exists, this one, powdery mildew. Um, so this was an interesting story. This, this, is, this has been um, plaguing many people. It has probably destroyed far more cannabis than the DEA. Uh, it is known to, to, when it hits, take out half people's crop and it hits at the worst time possible, ends up hitting late in growth, but all the papers suggest, and in our data as well, suggest that this is heavily vascularized. This gets into the cells uh, and spreads throughout the plant and may not always be evident or visible. Um, and in fact, it probably travels in clones, uh, and this is um, why we need an assay to pick it up when you can't see it. Early detection is the best way of eradicating a disease, and if you can detect it early, you can, you can remove it before it gets into sporulation mode where it spreads. Um, so this could be lying dormant. You need a DNA assay. We looked into the hemp diseases and pest book to look for some targets. All of these failed, meaning the thing on cannabis, at least in New England, whatever's growing on cannabis, is not Eltorica, P. macularis, or Golovinomyces. There's a, uh, nothing but a, a, <clears throat> a lot of failure in that department. So we decided, all right, it's time to, um, uh, to sequence this thing's genome. If we can't get uh, those assays to work on what is believed to be the powdery mildew in the field, then we have to, uh, we have to figure out what this is. And so uh, that meant we had to scrape these things off of 
scrape these spores off of plants uh, and sequence them very carefully. You can't just punch a hole in this and sequence it. Otherwise, you sequence a lot of cannabis DNA, you sequence a lot of penicillium DNA. You have to really enrich for the for the spores and whole genome shotgun those. Uh, and so we did this uh, at four different locations to build a consensus of what this thing is. And it turns out it's novel. It's not an NCBI, uh, and uh, it that proves to to make. Um, Primer design fairly tricky if you don't know what it is you're targeting. Um, so after we we figured out what this genome is, we went back and designed new primers, uh, and now we have the results we're looking for, which is the clean samples end up not lighting up on them, and the PM samples uh, light up quite readily. And of course, this got us questioning: Well, if one sample lights up, do you see it on the neighboring plants that are thought to be resistant? And we did go and sample a few of those, uh, some hash plants that were thought to be um, immune or, or resistant to powdery mildew. We didn't see any evidence of it vascularized in those. Um, and we sampled a couple other locations and, and also asked others to pull in samples for us. Uh, and in cases where we had negatives, uh, we wanted to ensure that we didn't just undersample those leaves and we went and hypersampled them in the lower right to ensure that they were in fact pink everywhere, which would mean that they are negative for powdery mildew um, all throughout uh, the leaf. We collected a few more of these from um, CT Pharmaceuticals just to expand it, and all of theirs lit up uh, with uh, in concordance with the positive controls. And the NTCs you see there are no template controls. That just shows you that when you put the same water that you're using in the reaction into your solution, that the water itself doesn't turn the sample uh, yellow. So in conclusions, we have a UPCR assay uh, for <clears throat> that's behaving for cannabis-derived PM. We do need more geographic samplings. There could, in fact, be those other organisms in different geographic locations, and we just haven't sampled them yet. Uh, there could be two species. In fact, if you look at wheat, wheat has two different blue areas that infect it. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, it's unlikely, however, that this is the same as being being an obligate biotrove. Usually obligate biotroves will, will definitely um, evolve toward their host, and so it's unlikely that uh, the other uh, species we find is is likely to be find, found on a different plant. Um, so, but we will see. Um, <clears throat> there is also some sampling questions in, in regards to picking up dormants. If this is lying dormant in clones, how vascularized is it? How many times do we have to sample that plant to pick it up? Um, those are those are some unknown questions that we are pursuing at the moment. But um, knowing this, uh, we have now a good genotyping system um, that can pick up male, female, CBD, and powdery mildew, and we're going to expand that list. And the other thing that we're thinking of expanding that list onto, uh, or expanding into that list, is to, to look at cannabis STRs. Uh, Houston has been making great progress publishing uh, 13 or 16 STR marker sets to turn classified cannabis. Um, the verdict's still out whether you want to do 30 SNPs versus uh, 16 STRs. The STRs limit the technology you can use to read them because they're a little bit more complicated to read. Um, but nevertheless, um, they are extraordinarily cheap to read if you have a capillary electrophoresis instrument. Unfortunately, Capillary electrophoresis instruments are 50 grand and they're not field portable. And so our efforts here were to try to drive these onto minions, which are field portable, and have a roadmap to potentially have uh, a smidge eye, an even smaller minion that was, is hopefully a cheaper flow cell. Um, the only challenge with uh, this approach here is the flow cells are 600 to 800 bucks, and in order for this platform to make any sense per run, you'd have to pull hundreds of um, STRs on it at a go. And uh, that's just not um, really congruent with the batch cycles people want to use to do fingerprinting in the field. Why do people want to do this type of STR fingerprinting? Well, this is another mechanism of perhaps doing seed to cell tracking. You can have barcodes on plants, much like the genotyping barcodes that we are suggesting we do with SNPs. Um, and uh, you can utilize this to pinpoint things into Canopedia. So stay tuned on this. We're, we are in the process of evaluating whether or not we include STR mapping on Canopedia so that if you happen to use this platform as opposed to another one, you can still triangulate yourself into the database. But um, the SNPs right now are looking to be the priority just because we believe we can scale those to nanoliter, nanoliter levels uh, and bring the cost and the scale of them, the cost down and the scale up tremendously on a colorimetric test that can be done in 1536 or even smaller formats. Um, lots of microfluidics are out these days that are, will likely take great advantage of a colorimetric test like that that can be 
um, photographed with a mobile phone. Uh, and if we can do 30 SNPs like that with the, <laughs> under the cost of doing a THC test, we might as well be thinking about not just capturing the fingerprint for seed to cell tracking issues, but capturing the male female status, the CBD, the powdery mildew, perhaps terpene markers, and any of the microbial risks. But this list, you can see, will grow on and on and on. And that is the whole uh, purpose of marker assisted selection. If you can do these things, the moment the leaves come out of the ground, um, you can accelerate your breeding process um, <clears throat> tremendously. And this is how uh, the vast majority of the rest of the agricultural genomics market works is they do what's known as marker assisted selection. And now the MAS, for cannabis at least, can be pushed point of growth. Lots of folks were required to make this happen. We had collaborators from Colorado Seeds, Connecticut Pharmaceuticals, Proverdi, New England Biolabs, Icon, Amplius, NIDA, Digipath, Sonova Labs, and many other collaborators on this. Uh, lots of work on the quartagen and initial genomics side as well. Uh, tremendous amount of effort here. And in closing, I will just reiterate that keeping your genetics local has some benefits. We are seeing business plans of parties in the field that look at the XY testing as a massive data intake tool. That is their business plan. So buyer beware and look at those T's and C's in the process. Otherwise, get your own device and do it yourself. UPCR is easy and it's here.